welcome tonight. This is the last time that we're meeting together. So, well, uh, for this for this class anyway. Um, so our plan for tonight, as far as the schedule goes, is for each of us in turn to present. And so we'll be working through your presentations, different passages you've worked on, the insights from that. And that should fill up the time here. Um, so here's what I think we'll do here, if we may. We'll open up in prayer. And then, Brother Gerard, if it's okay with you, maybe I would ask you to go first. Um, if that works all right on your end, great. So maybe I'll open us in prayer, and then I'll hand it over to Brother Gerard. And then just from there, we can go volunteer by volunteer. Uh, if each person wants to jump in when you're ready. And so we can proceed like that. Um, so let's pray and ask that the Lord will bless our time and then we'll, we'll jump right into our content. Father, we thank you tonight for what you have taught us for the last two months and the last um, eight weeks together of meeting, you have opened up your word to us in so many new ways and taught us many things. We're grateful for that. We're grateful for what we've seen here, the richness of your word and learning and realizing just how utterly inexhaustible it is. We knew that it was, and yet every time that we have the opportunity to, to dig deeper and search further, we are reminded again in greater and richer ways how utterly inexhaustible your truth is. So we thank you for that. I thank you also for my brothers and sisters that have put in so much time and just it's, it's an expression again that they love you, that they love your word, that they're wanting to learn. And we're grateful for that. I thank you very much for their diligence, their sacrifice of time, sacrifice of life for this end. And I pray that you would bless them in each one of their ministries as you have already blessed us through the attention that you've allowed us to give to your word. Pray that this would continue. Pray that this would not just be limited to our class together, but really that learning about um, the rich inter internal structure of your word would continue to shape our teaching and our preaching and our discipleship and most of all, our personal growth as we each try to follow you. So we thank you for all of this. You have poured on the blessings for us in these weeks. And now as we spend this time together, this last year, I just pray that you would teach us again. I pray that we would benefit from the work and the labor, the investment of our brothers and sisters here and that we would be able, again, to have the same experience of being in awe at what you have spoken. So we ask this all in your sense. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Brother Gerard, I'll hand it off to you um, and look forward to what you have to share with us here. You're all set now. We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, are you seeing my screen? No, right? Yes, sir. Are we see your we see your camera? See my camera. See. Yes, sir. Oh, too nice. Okay. Um. So all of you are hearing me. Okay. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Okay, yeah. Sounds good, huh? Okay. Uh, so, the overall context of this passage is actually quite obvious. Uh, if you just uh, look at the uh, verse 2 and 4, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, having become as much superior to angels. So, so the key is uh, superior to angels. He's comparing the sun to angels. Uh, the purpose is he's trying, he's trying to show that Christ is not just an ordinary son or even an inherited one. Uh, he is, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, as we go, as we proceed, uh, he's, he's going to show that this son is actually God himself. 
okay, when we come to verse 8. Okay, so um, that is the New Testament context. So what the author tries to do in this passage is uh, he strings together a series of passages um, from the OT to prove the point that the, you know, the, the sun is greater than the angels. So he's comparing with, with the angels. So he, he, he gets all the various passages that concern angels. Okay. Um, so I think um, this passage flows, or rather Hebrews itself, the book of Hebrews, uh, follow very closely to the Septuagint rather than the NT. Uh, yeah. We will uh, just uh, read that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now I will just proceed with the analysis, uh, starting from verse 5. Okay, uh, so we just look at the English verse first. Uh, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then uh, in uh, Psalm 2 verse 7, uh, the first part is uh, different, but the, the last part is the same. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay, and um, when we look at the Septuagint, and uh, it, it corresponds uh, one to one. It's completely identical. Uh, you can just uh, see. Okay, and then um, in the second part, or again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Uh, evidently, this is a from Second Samuel seven fourteen, uh, the Davidic covenant. Uh, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Okay, and um, so so here uh, we we see we see that um, in quoting uh, Psalm two uh, verse seven uh, in the previous part of verse 5, okay, and then in uh, quoting uh, 2 Samuel uh, 7.14, I think the author of Hebrew is trying to link that this son is actually the uh, son of David, uh, God's anointed one, okay, and uh, let me go back to the context of uh, Psalm 2, um, the Old Testament context of Psalm 2 speak of nations and kings in rebellion against God and his anointed one. Okay, but God will put down the rebellion by giving the king power and uh, he will enthrone the king on Mount Zion. Okay, that will be in the Psalm uh, 2, verse 2 and 6. Okay, so he has proclaimed, maybe I should go back, uh, go back to my Psalm 2. Okay, uh, okay, so uh, in uh, some two contexts, he has, um, he said, uh, you are my son, today I've begotten you, okay? So, um, the, the phrase I've begotten you does not refer to a king physically born to God, as might be expected in uh, ancient Eastern Mediterranean culture. Okay, but instead the father-son relationship is seen as a divine support or assistance for the king. This is according to the uh, commentary on the New Testament use of Old Testament. Huh? Um, so uh, so that the phrase as understood by Near Eastern uh, culture people is uh, not, not the physical son, okay? but rather a, a son in the sense of being assisted and uh, given support, okay? And um, as we go to, let me see, so, yeah. As we go to the second part of uh, verse five, um, he, he not only talked about a son, but he linked this son with a Davidic son, okay? He linked this son with a Davidic son and uh, he actually uh, in the in the Greek 
in the septuagint uh, is also again uh, almost a quotation, a exact quotation. Okay, so there's there's no problem there. Okay, so um, so by linking it to the Davidic son, um, people have the idea that this uh, this he's talking about not just any son, but that particular son uh, that God will send. Uh, whom the Jews call the anointed one or the Messiah, okay, and um, so so the Old Testament context, of course, is uh, of Second Samuel seven fourteen is uh, God's covenant with David. Uh, in this context, the son actually refers to Solomon, uh, David's immediate son. Uh, but the author of Hebrew saw it fit to apply to the ultimate son, Jesus Christ, uh, because both Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 was considered messianic by uh, uh, some Jews of the day. Okay, And moreover, 2 Samuel 7, 16, uh, the Davidic uh, kingdom and throne will be established forever. Okay, When we read the Davidic covenant, uh, is is uh, he will not fail to have a son uh, to sit on his throne, so it's is a uh, implied uh, uh, kind of eternal uh, truth kingdom. Okay, of course, uh, it cannot apply to Solomon because we know that uh, immediately after Solomon's death, uh, his kingdom was split into two, right? So, so it cannot apply to the immediate son. Okay, so um. So while the context actually talk about his uh, more uh, referring to some, but there's a there's a distant there's a distant uh, fulfillment of that uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, so um, so we go to the next verse. Uh, this verse is a a, a, a rather difficult. Huh? Um, Chapter one six. Uh, because if you look at the English version, uh, if you just read the English, you don't, you can hardly find any words no, similar. Uh, maybe bow down to him or God. You know? um, so so obviously, I think the ESV translated from the MT rather than the Septuagint. Uh, so uh, so there's a quite a lot of difference. Um, so we need to explain no, how. How the Hebrew author, you know, get this verse uh, from Deuteronomy thirty-two forty-three. Uh, so there's a okay. So if you look at the Septuagint uh, version, you find that even in the Septuagint version, uh, um, uh, the last two part, last two part, uh. uh yeah, I don't know if you can see the cursor. Okay, uh, angels of God, the last two words, uh, angels of God for the uh, Nestle Allen 28, and uh, Septuagint is the uh, sons of God. Okay, so it's not a real quotation. Okay, there's a difference between the two. Um, so some people propose uh, in the next verse, there's a mention of angels of God. Okay, angels of God. So uh, they say that um, well, the author of Hebrews actually uh, equated because of the parallelism between these these uh, two verses, uh, equated the sons of God with angels of God, and sometimes um, the sons of God is indeed referring to angels of God huh, elsewhere. Uh, but uh, I think there's a better explanation, and the better explanation uh, is that. Um, he used um, the apoc apocryphal uh, portion of the Septuagint, okay? And um, there's a book called Oaths, uh, the Oaths 243, which, has a, which actually quotes Deuteronomy 3243. Okay, what was this book of Oaths? Uh, although it's uh, in the apocryphal uh, section of the Septuagint, it is uh, actually a quotation of the scriptures. Okay, I can show you uh, the slide. So let's say the oath, you have a 1, 2, 3, up to 14. 
under Oats 2, you can see Song of Moses 2, and then the source is actually Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 43. Okay, so uh, it's actually the scripture itself, but it's a, it's a different translation. Huh? Uh, you can call it a different translation, maybe a later one. Okay, um, so, so when, 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 uh, let me, let me go back again. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so by using this translation, um, the writer to the Hebrew uh, appeared to have purposefully selected the reading found in the post because it was immediately applicable as an indication of some ordination of the angels of the sun. Okay, I'm very sorry. Uh, actually, I, I do have it. I do have it uh, with me. Uh, but I did put it on slide. If you look at post 243, okay, let me go back to the slide again. Uh. Um, so, Oats number two, number two forty three will be equivalent to Deuteronomy thirty two forty three. Okay, so if you compare the two, uh, it's almost identical except for one article. Okay, for one article, I'm very sorry, I could not. Uh, I, I guess overlook, uh, overlook it. Okay, so so is uh, exactly identical in the except for one additional article okay so by quoting oats to um 43 and which is deuteron deuteronomy 32 43 okay so the author of he uh he moves uh, appear to purposely use this reading because uh you can see immediately the sub ordination of the angels to the sun okay so um, so so this is from the commentary by William Lane uh, on the book of Hebrews okay this is what he said okay so um, there's something interesting uh, about uh, this passage because um, because uh, Deuteronomy 32 um, is the Song of Moses, okay? It's a Song of Moses which occurs near the end of the book of Deuteronomy, the, where the final section uh, anticip anticipates uh, Israel's entrance into the Promised Land, okay? The song is uh, situated in the narrative just after the law is finished. Uh, that means um, Moses actually finished uh, Calling the law and prior to Moses' final exhortation to the people. Okay, so uh, in this song, Moses proclaims the downfall of God's enemies and his ultimate deliverance of his people. Okay, so, so um, uh, that is the purpose of a uh, quoting from Deuteronomy uh, to show that. Moses proclaimed the downfall of God's enemies, okay, and uh, ultimate deliverance of his people. So, what has this got to do with uh, uh, Hebrews 1 6? Uh, um, and let all the angels worship him, right? That's what Hebrews 1 6 says. Um, okay, uh, let's uh, this CDP graph here. Okay, call, um, it's called the life of Adam and Eve. Okay, uh, this should, uh, CDP graphical, graphical work, uh, uh, explains Satan's failure to worship Adam. Was the reason he and his angels were expelled from glory and cast to the earth. Huh? Uh, so, I mean, this, I mean, this might sound a bit far fetched, but I think uh, we have to understand the Jewish mind. Okay, this is how the Jewish people think. Okay, and the author of uh, Hebrews is writing according to what the Jewish people think. Okay, so this is a, a Jewish tradition. Okay, and I'll show you a quote. Okay, okay so after God um, uh, created Adam, 
and uh, God wanted the angels to worship uh, him. Okay, worship him. Uh, okay, let me let me uh, explain first. Okay, then I'll, I I'll answer your health query. Of course, uh, we don't worship anyone. Uh, uh, but uh, this this uh, Jewish tradition goes like this. So Michael himself worshiped first and called me. This is uh, Satan talking, okay? Uh, in the this uh, life of Adam and Eva, to, to the pre-graphical world. Okay, worship the image of God. Okay, man was made in the image of God, uh, Yahweh. And I, Satan, answered, uh, I do not worship Adam. And when Michael kept forcing me to worship, I said to him, why do you compel me? I will not worship one inferior and subsequent to me. I'm prior to him in creation. Before he was made, I was already made. He ought to worship me. Okay. And, uh, and it is because of uh, Satan's refusal to worship Adam, okay, uh, that he was cast down to earth. Okay, with, together with his angels. Okay, and uh, Satan further declares that he will set his throne above the stars of heaven and will be like God. Okay, because of the great grief of being cast down to earth and seeing the bliss of Adam and Eve. Okay, this is what Satan is seeing. So the devil tempted Eve to make sure that humans also fell and were expelled from God's presence, okay? So, the, the background of Hebrew 1.6 is um, this Jewish tradition, okay, of uh, people refusing to worship the first man. So, uh, the author of Hebrews make use of this Jewish background to actually tell them to worship the second Adam, which is Christ, okay, the Son of God, okay? So, um, so by calling them to worship uh, the son, he is trying to play on this background. You see what happened when they refused to worship the, the first uh, the first son of God? Uh? Uh, uh, what's the consequences? So now uh, the Jews will understand okay, uh, the severity of refusing to worship Christ uh, in that same sense. And, uh, Satan refused to uh, kind of worship uh, uh, Adam okay, and was cast down to, the, to earth. Okay? So, um, of course, for us, uh, we, we know uh, uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot worship man. Uh, Adam is just a man. Okay? Um, but he's using this background to teach us to worship the second Adam. Okay? So, uh, that's, that's all I can say here. Okay, I mean you can debate here, uh, but uh, but that's the background. And and this part also came from the commentary on the uh, New Testament use of the Old Testament. Okay, uh, so the rest is uh, more straightforward. Bruce one angels his angels beams and his ministers a flame of fire. So he continued his um, use of angel passages in the Old Testament. Huh? So that corresponds to Psalm 104, verse 4, or the Septuagint, Psalm 103, verse 4. Huh? He made his messengers. Huh? Messengers actually is Angi Loy, huh? which also can be translated uh, angels. Okay? A winds, his ministers, uh, flaming fire. So when we look at the the Greek and the Septuagint, is very close, huh? uh, except for the last two words. Okay, a flame of fire and a flaming uh, fire. So so that will be uh, the difference. Okay, difference in form. Okay, so finally we look at the last two. Okay. I think uh, verse 8 is the epitome of the whole uh, passage concerning the deity of Christ. Okay. Um, okay, so, so let me go through that uh, quickly. 
of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of the of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Um, okay, because of space, I cannot put them together. But if you read through, you find that it's almost identical. Huh? Almost identical. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Okay, so when we look at uh, um, the Greek, um, is uh, for verse eight, uh, Hebrews one eight is pretty similar. Okay, uh, except I think you can see uh, some. Uh, uh, like conjunction, conjunction missing, okay? Um, the conjunction is missing, and I think, uh, I think I can see some, uh, yeah, this article is missing, okay? Um, you see, there's no article. There's article in the uh, Hebrew 1.8, but there's no article in the Septuagint. So it's just a conjunction and, and article differences. No, nothing, nothing much, uh, nothing much. So you can you can call it a quotation. And for the next verse, is virtually identical. Okay, there is a uh, no, no, no difference. Okay, no, no difference. Um, so um, in summary, you can just call Hebrews one eight to nine. Uh, quoting uh, this Psalm 45, huh? Psalm 45, uh, 7, uh, 6 to 7. Okay. Okay. Um, psalm 45 in the Old Testament is a royal psalm. Huh? The context of Psalm 45 is a praise to the king who is uh, addressed later as God Elohim. Okay. The author has previously quoted 2 Samuel 7.14 that speaks of the Davidic king. And now he linked this king uh, to Psalm 45, who is addressed as God uh, or Elohim. Okay, so hence the author of Hebrews sees the future fulfillment of the uh, Davidic covenant. Okay, um, this king is not any human being but uh, the Messiah himself huh, who is God. So uh, this king he also ascribes as being enthroned forever. Huh? Your throne of God is forever. Uh, he's being enthroned forever so cannot refer to any any human being. Huh? He has to refer to the uh, messianic kingdom. And um, also the mention of throne and kingdom is a dominant theme in both Psalm 2, 7 and 2 Samuel 7, 14. Okay, so um, this is the only occurrence in Hebrew scriptures where the king is addressed as a God of Elohim. Okay, uh, we, we, we know, we know uh, for example, in Egypt, okay, the Pharaoh is, Address as a God also. Okay, but not in the Hebrew scriptures. Huh? This is the only occurrence whereby in uh, Psalm 45, um, a king is being addressed as God. Okay, so um, so here is, you can say is um, uh, this, this king is not a mere man, but God himself. Okay, God Elohim himself. Moreover, this king is um, described as a some person that loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Okay, therefore, this king bears the holy character of God. Okay, so um, so we, we see from this passage, um, the the author proceeds okay uh, from a very uh, a string of passages that. Um, 
concerned angels to this very passage that address okay um, the king as God. Okay, so so here he's actually making a reference to the deity of the sun. Okay, the sun. So the sun here will of course in the Hebrew text will refer to Jesus Christ the Son, but at the same time he is uh, referring to his deity. Okay, so uh, in my conclusion. So the author demonstrates through the use of Old Testament scriptures that the Son is no ordinary human being and definitely far above angels. In fact, uh, is that the Son is God himself. Okay, uh, this is my presentation. Okay, thanks. Oops. Great. Thank you very much. I, I got a blessing just from looking through those passages. So I appreciate that very much. Just the, I, I, taking the notes through those and adding those to my notes, which anyway, you could pull that out of a study Bible, but just looking at each one of those passages in turn and kind of processing what was going on was a blessing. Thank you. Um, okay. The one that, <laughs> the one that you gave us was the most controversial <laughs> and I'm sorry, uh, pulling this, yeah. my notes in will cut off my camera. Um, but the most controversial one, uh, verse six, the Deuteronomy passage. Um, so I'll just toss an idea, idea out here and you see how this hits you. Um, okay. So you have that. You also have Psalm 97, seven that does almost the same wording. Actually, mm -hmm. I'd have to look again at the Greek, uh, the Septuagint side, but maybe even closer. Uh, and that's, I think in our English translation, it comes English translations. It comes in as worship him, all you gods. Um, anyway, so I'm between those two passages, the Deuteronomy 32 and 97, seven, um, I'm very reluctant to go to an extra canonical source and use that as authoritative. So we know that like, we know that Jude references, and Paul references, you know, we have this handful of places where uh, Titus, there's a couple other places where they'll reference extra, extra canonical sources. But to act, reference an extra canonical source as scriptural, which I would, I would argue that's at least the impression mm. that Hebrews gives me, that would be different. Mm. That would start undermining my doctrine of canonicity. I'm throwing these thoughts, thoughts out here and then happy to see your response. Um, and then I'm also really reluctant to base, like on an authority, go for an authoritative basis to something extra canonical or Jewish tradition. Um, I'm happy to look at those things and say, well, okay, you know, these things exist, but now how about this though? I feel like I have, could have warrant for duty, doing Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 97, seven, worship them all you gods. The Elohim can be used and is used in different places. Job explicitly. So I think Genesis six, probably so sons of God as a way of referring to angelic spirits. So what if, the way we handle this is just that we do it translationally. So um, where I'm reading, worship him all you gods, basically we, we're monotheists. We don't believe that there are other gods, but Elohim has enough flexibility in it that it can refer to angels. And therefore, basically the author of Hebrews is interpreting how I ought to read that Elohim there. Worship him all you spirits, worship him all you angels. And in support of that notion, now I could pull in your extra canonical reference to say um, somebody else recognized that Elohim could be used that way, it, not authoritatively. It's not like authoritative for how we read the passage, but it, it at least is um, giving us some lexical basis that Elohim has enough room in it for this kind of rendering. And so therefore, I'm happy in that case to appeal to the extra can canonical source as a linguistic vote, but not as an authoritative vote. Um, Brother Kenneth here had a comment that kind of, let's see, I, I saw part of it. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. 
and what he's doing there, I think, is I think what Jesus' argument, the shape of his argument, is this angelic sort of notion. Um, so Elohim having enough lexical flexibility in it that it can refer to angel angelic beings. Okay, Brother Gerard, what do you think? How how does that strike you, or how would push back, or however, how would you process that? Oh yeah. I also have the same difficulty because um, uh, the, the point is uh, Psalm 97 doesn't correspond with exactly the uh, Okay. I was trying to decide if uh, okay, one passage that actually corresponds almost Exactly, Deuteronomy 32, 43. And um, so, so if, if the author actually go in that direction, okay, and um, Deuteronomy is actually talking about not defeating his enemies. And, uh, so, so the, whatever happens, um, I mean, the fact is um, that uh, although the word God can can have a fluid expression, okay, elsewhere, um, but uh, you don't call anyone God uh, specifically, and then he also linked with the uh, uh, Davidic covenant, okay, the Messiah. So there's a, there's a lot of themes being linked together in this passage, okay. So. Um, I'm just thinking that um, what the author is trying to do is make use of what the Jewish people believe. And, and he's not trying to make a canonical you know, uh, proof. Okay, he's just addressing, uh, uh, he's trying to heighten the seriousness uh, of not uh, worshipping the sun. Huh? Christ, because because uh, you know in the book of Hebrews the uh, the whole issue is uh, uh, the Judaizers are trying to draw the Christian Jews back back into the uh, old religion, uh, uh, Judaism. Uh, so so what happened is the the author of Hebrew is trying to persuade the people don't ever do that, okay? Because you are not going to be safe after that. Huh? I think that's in a, there's a passage that talks about that. I think Hebrew 10. Huh? You cannot tremble the blood of Christ okay? and uh, have repentance. So I think his tone is very serious. As we know, there are passages in, many passages in Hebrew that trouble us, right? About kind of some sort of like losing our salvation. Right? So um, I think what he, he wants to do is uh, bring across the seriousness of uh, this uh, regarding uh, Christ, okay, how, how they regard him, whether do they think of him as God or, you know, just as an angel or prophet, you know. So I think uh, he's trying to uh, minister to the Jews in this aspect. And in, in this case, it doesn't affect me because I, I know very clearly that Christ is God. Okay, but for for Jewish people who do not know that, uh, I think he's trying to play on their their background knowledge, and he's not trying to give a canonical proof. Okay, that um, uh, Christ is God. It's, it's just like um, I think if I preach to a Buddhist, I must I must if I if I know his religion well, uh, I can make use of uh, what he used. He do and what what is this? What we call gospel contextualization, but uh, still still a biblical contextualization. Um, but uh, I can still make use of his uh, worldview, his worldview, and uh, try to make him see that the Christian worldview is a better one. Some sort of of that. So the the main thing for me is still yeah, the the main thing is still uh the exactness of the quotation with uh, Deuteronomy 32, 43. Yeah. I get it. So you're basically, the shape of your argument, I think, is he's doing it polemically. 
um, and he's yeah. using their tradition to argue polemically. So, yeah. no, I, uh, and I have to go, we have to go to the next person here somewhere. I think the pushback yeah. there would go something like, I would want to look for some exegetical indicators that lead me to expect that or something. But, um, okay. Yeah, and I, what this makes me want to do, it makes me want to go back also and look at the um, New Testament use of the Old Testament commentary and see kind of how they, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious yeah. how they're doing as an evaluation towards the tool. I, I haven't seen them do an argument of that shape. Uh, that It's a little bit, it's a little bit a leftward argument. Um, I don't, I haven't seen, I haven't personally read them doing something that uh, far there. So I'd be curious to kind of evaluate the source in that way. Okay, interesting, uh, provocative, and um, some some uh, parallels. I got a blessing very much out of the Davidic Covenant connection, Psalm 2. Um, anyway, some rich things there. Great, okay, got to keep on going, uh, just for sake of time. Who would be willing to go next? Who is willing to go next for us now? Um, just looking across, Brother... Uh, let's see. Uh, Duncan, are you willing? Are you ready to go? What do you think there? I'm, I'm ready and able to go. Uh, Phil was just saying before that in the chat that he was... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Yeah, sure. I'll let way. you guys fight it out. <laughs> well, you're the boss. Uh, Dr. K, if you want to go ahead, great. Okay, uh, and I want to share my screen, which I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Um, so, uh, things that I'm going to say. So, I chose Romans 15, 9 to 12, and I would encourage you to look at that in your Bible. Um, it's... Uh, it's important and helpful because it's part of a very extended paragraph about missions in the book of Romans. So as a missionary, that appeals to me. Uh, and it helps you understand some theology about missions. And it's helpful for this class because it has four Old Testament quotations, which is the largest part of the paragraph. Uh, the whole paragraph is Romans 15, 8 to 13, and 9 to 12. Those four verses are four out of the six verses. So a major part of this, of his argument in this paragraph is Old Testament quotations. And uh, number three point there was that these four Old Testament quotations, one right after the other, uh, raises some questions. Uh, number one, is it communicating uh, these four quotations, one after the other, a progression of thought? Or is it just a repeated emphasis of one truth? Uh, second question I, I had was, is Paul using each of these four quotations uh, really according to its Old Testament context? And that's one of our main questions in intertextuality. Uh, third question was, from the Old Testament context of each quotation, can I derive from that any theological insight that informs Paul's use of this quotation in Romans 15 and what he's trying to say about missions? So uh, first thing I want to do here is to understand the passage in the New Testament how Paul is using these quotations in its context. So the, uh, again, the whole paragraph is Romans 15, 8 to 13. And just a little bit of context here. Uh, this is part of an entire exhortation by Paul in chapters 14 to 15, that believers should receive weaker brothers. And that began in chapter 14, continues in chapter 15, and if you saw Romans 15, verse 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
So again, the, uh, the topic of this, these two chapters, or chapter and a half, is receiving weaker brothers. And verse 7, uh, receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And then verses 18 to 13, our paragraph is explaining this. Uh, how did Christ received us, receive us to the glory of God? Uh, and uh, uh, this, this should actually be verse 7 here. Um, Christ became a servant, a minister for the truth of God. And verse 9, so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And that statement is a statement that Paul uses for Old Testament quotations to support. Uh, Christ became a servant that the Gentiles might glorify God. And, and then these four Old Testament quotations. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So four Old Testament quotations, all talking about Gentiles needing to rejoice in in God. So again, these are our questions that I already covered. Uh, is Paul using this according to the context and, and any insight we can gain from that? So uh, the second section here is uh, examining the, the text for any variance and then comparing the Greek text to the Hebrew text and the Septuagint. Uh, simply there are really no major variants uh, worth uh, talking about. Anything there can be ex easily explained. Uh, secondly, how did the Old New Testament quotations uh, compare to the Old Testament original, both the Hebrew Masori Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint? So uh, verse 9 Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That is from 2 Samuel 22, 50, originally. And it's uh, a statement by David. And in Psalms, that is repeated almost verbatim. Uh, and as we examine all this, uh, the Septuagint with the Greek uh, and the Masoretic text, a little translation of that, my conclusion is that it's basically an exact quote uh, with no difference between it and the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Oops. So let me go to the second um, quotation. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And uh, Gerard was just mentioning Deuteronomy 32, 43, but this is a different part of that verse. So it's interesting that that verse is uh, uh, quoted at least a couple of times in the New Testament. Um, this, is, this is kind of fraught with some problems. The ESV translation of Deuteronomy 32, 43 is very different from... Uh, Paul's quoting this in Romans. ESV says, Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, O all gods. And uh, it doesn't really mention the ESV, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. But the Septuagint does have that. The ESV marginal notes state that the Masoretic text reads only, Rejoice his people, O nations. Um, but that is not the only way to translate the Masoretic text. And we're going to see that, we're going to see that a little bit later here. So if you compare the, uh, the Greek text with the Septuagint, I've put in bold there uh, the fact that the Septuagint does have that phrase, 
even though the ESV does not translate that phrase. I'm not exactly sure why. The ESV only translates uh, the part of the Septuagint up to that uh, bold point, uh, bold uh, phrase. So um, if you look at uh, letter, small letter D there, the literal translation of the Masoretic text, rejoice, O nations, for or with his people, for or with is in brackets because that is not in the text, but um, many translations supply that as the idea. So it is possible, according to the ESV, to translate it, rejoice his people, O nations. And that's like the Tanakh translation. Um, but that is not how the Septuagint reads. And, and uh, that's not how Paul uh, quotes it. So I guess I'll just go to the point here, the, the summary. Paul is quoting the Septuagint's interpretation of the meaning of the Masoretic text. So uh, the Masoretic text can be translated two different ways. The Septuagint, when it translated, translates it, it translates it with a meta, uh, with, so, uh, which is how Paul also, he's quoting the Septuagint. And uh, so he's taking the Septuagint's translation uh, and interpretation of, what, of the meaning of the Masoretic text. Okay, let's go to, to the next one. And I'll try to move a little faster here because we want to get to the theological point. Uh, verse 11 of Romans 15, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. It's from Psalm 117, verse 1. And no difference there among all three of those uh, texts. And verse 12, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. And that is from Isaiah 11.10. Which, if you read that there, in that day the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. That is seems to be totally different <laughs> from how Paul is translating or quoting Isaiah 11.10. So what is happening there? Uh, uh, when you compare the Greek text, small a, with the Septuagint, small b, you can see that actually Paul is quoting not the Masoretic text here. He's quoting the Septuagint. Uh, because in the Septuagint, you see all the same words. Uh, not all the words are quoted by Paul, but uh, all the words that he quotes are in the Septuagint text. Um, so uh, I guess one question we have is, why is the Septuagint so different from the Masoretic text? Um, I don't really have a full answer for that, but I think there is harmony still here that we could see because the, the theological meaning of the Masoretic text is the Septuagint uh, text. So it may be that the Septuagint is kind of a, not in this part, in this verse, not literally translating the Masoretic text, but kind of paraphrasing the main idea of the Masoretic text. The general theological idea. Yeah. Okay, um, so now we want to go to uh, understanding the quoted Old Testament passages in their context and any theological implications intended by Paul in Romans 15. So verse 9, 
Uh, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So my first bullet point there is that it's from Psalm uh, Second Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. They're almost identical. Uh, Psalm 18, second point, states in greater detail that Second Samuel 22 than Second Samuel 22, that these are David's words that he sang to the Lord when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And that historical context helps us to understand a little bit more of why Paul is using Romans, uh, why Paul is using this 2 Samuel 22, 50 in Romans 15. The context is one of, of deliverance. Uh, when we look at it in Romans 15, 9, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. We don't know the context, but the context is one of salvation. The Lord delivering David from all his enemies and from Saul. So that is helpful because that's really the reason why the Gentiles should praise God for his mercy, for his salvation. So David's praise to God for salvation from his enemies is the overall theme of Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22. So that perfectly fits uh, with how Paul is using it. Praise to God for his deliverance from enemies. Um, so I think I will skip this point for time. Um, maybe I will say that the nations in the context of verse 50, if you look at the previous verses, verses 48 and 49 of 2 Samuel 22, uh, those nations were described as sinful people who are violent attackers and um, that spiritually that is true also for how what the Gentiles have been delivered from uh, the sin that is uh, an enemy, a violent enemy. So um, let me skip here. So my point, this perfectly parallels David praising God for being the Savior and for saving him from his enemies. So uh, Paul's use of this Old Testament quotations uh, leads readers to remember the, uh, from the Old Testament context, the reason for giving praise to God is salvation from violent enemies. Uh, also to remember, number two, the status of a believer in relation to enemies. Uh, I should have I should have read uh, what I had put in bold earlier, because the context of Second Samuel 22 mentions how David was not only rescued from these enemies, but he was made kings over them, and uh, now speaks among them, and that's if you kind of use that to inform Romans 15. Uh, believers have been rescued from their enemies, and we've been made kings over our enemies with authority over them, which makes us think of, of Matthew 28. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. So we have authority to speak to uh, those opposing Christ and opposing us. Uh, and this was used, the Psalm, 2 Samuel 22 quote is also used in Psalm 18, where it becomes uh, Israel's song, part of their worship, and Israel was to be a witness to the nations around them by praising the Lord. And that, again, is in keeping with individual believers to supposed to be a witness to the people around them. Uh, the second quotation, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Um, 
that directly supports what Paul had said, that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And this is the Deuteronomy 32 passage. Um, I want to try to shorten this. But um, notice that this Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 uh, describes Israel's election, sin, judgment, and salvation. And that is why Deuteronomy 32 is used by Paul in Romans multiple times. Romans 10, 19, Romans 12, 19, Romans 15, 10, regarding election, sin, judgment, and salvation. So a very contextually appropriate use of uh, Deuteronomy 32 by Paul. And significantly, Moses ends this song in Deuteronomy 32 in verse 43, quoted by Paul in Romans 15.10, exhorting the nations to rejoice because the Lord will judge his enemies and in so doing, avenge his people and make atonement for them. So I will just uh, go to the theological implications of all that. Um, the exhortation to Gentiles to rejoice practically, practically means that Gentiles should have a heart change. And because of the question is, why would Gentile nations rejoice that Gentile nations are being judged? <laughs> why would Gentiles rejoice in, in the judgment of other Gentiles? Um, and, in, and the, the ex exaltation of Israel. Well, that, that would definitely require a heart change uh, that means that they should experience the Lord's saving power. So regeneration uh, is kind of behind, assumed in that, that command to rejoice. Deuteronomy 32.43 also emphasizes that Gentile rejoicing, this Gentile rejoicing, is for God avenging the Jewish people and making atonement for them. So uh, uh, that, again, would require a heart change that uh, implies salvation of Gentiles, of individual Gentiles. Number two, like the first quotation, the Old Testament context specifies that their rejoicing is for God's salvation from hostile enemies. And again, Romans 15, the context is salvation, uh, God, glorifying God for his mercy. And you can see that more when you study Deuteronomy 32. Uh, the chapter context also indicates that this salvation is in the eschatological future of Israel. After they have turned away from God and been judged by him, uh, then God focuses on saving Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous. That's from Romans 9 to 11. And so these would be, in Romans 15, Gentiles of the church age who believed and experienced God's mercy. Um, so, again, Paul was using that perfectly in keeping with the whole context of Deuteronomy 32. Uh, verse 11 is shorter. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Um, there is really very little context, uh, contextual data, if any, uh, because uh, Psalm 117 is uh, not connected, really, to the other Psalms. Um, so much. There's no inscription there. But it does emphasize uh, the word all. Rejoice all you Gentiles. Laud him all the peoples. Um, but Psalm 117, 1, when we look at this Old Testament context, we do find out the reason why they should rejoice. And that's in verse 2. For his loving kindness is great toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord is everlasting. 
praise the Lord. So when Paul uses this verse, verse 1, in Romans 15, we don't see the reason why they should praise the Lord, why all nations should praise the Lord. But in, in verse 2 of Psalm 117, we see the reason why. Because of his love and faithfulness. And that is helpful in uh, uh, kind of helping to import that into the Romans 15 context. Um, and uh, in Psalms, probably uh, one of the reasons why the Jews, Israel, was to be thankful for the Lord's love and faithfulness was his, that he was a covenant-keeping God, uh, keeping the Abrahamic, Mosaic, and Davidic covenant. For the Roman believers, it would be for the Gentiles um, who would be saved in the New Covenant era. It would be that the Gentiles have experienced God mercifully showing his love and faithfulness to them and grafting them into the New Covenant. Uh, so lastly, verse 12, oops, uh, the root of Jesse. Oh boy, let me get back there. Okay. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Um, I've already talked about the what Paul is quoting there. Um, one point I'd like to make here is that in quoting from Isaiah 11:10, Paul has now quoted in Romans 15:9 to 12 from every part of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets. Uh, both the former and latter prophets, and the writings. So uh, I would say that's intentional. Um, Paul is showing that every part of the Old Testament encourages missions to the Gentiles. Isaiah 11, 10. Um, boy, I should shorten this here. For time's sake, I'll just say that Isaiah 11 is the context of, it looks like at first the millennial kingdom. But when you look at verses uh, verse 1 and 2, it really is mentioning the kingdom starting with Christ's incarnation. Uh, then the spirit of God comes upon him to minister uh, up to the millennium, and maybe even beyond. So it's not just referring to the millennial period, but just in general, uh, the, the coming of Christ and his kingdom, which starts with his incarnation. So that would include then the church age. So it's the Old Testament context is completely in keeping with how Paul is using it in Romans, since the church age is part of that entire era of Christ's kingdom. Uh, after verse 10, what Paul quotes in Romans 15, Isaiah focuses especially on how the Messiah will deliver his people Israel by judging various Gentile nations who are enemies of Israel. And again, we've seen that before. Uh, that idea, uh, praising God for his salvation of his people, which he saves his people in part by judging the Gentiles. Uh, so um, in the eschatological future, Christ will judge and reign over the nations. I'm looking in the middle here. However, during that time of Christ judging the world to bring in his kingdom on earth, many Gentiles will put their trust in him. So isn't it true that in Revelation, 
even though Christ is judging the nations in the world and uh, advancing his kingdom on earth, uh, that, he's, that also many Gentiles are being saved at the same time. So my conclusion uh, theologically there, Romans 15, 12 is not limited to the millennial period, as I already mentioned, but that entire area of era that began with Christ's coming, God uses Christ's judgment of enemies and saving of his people and ruling over them to bring Gentiles into the condition of hoping in Christ. And um, that's true in the eschatological future. But uh, if we want to look at that principally as a timeless truth, isn't it true that even now, Christ is judging his enemies in different ways, maybe by letting them become deeper and deeper into sin and perversion. And that is part of God bringing Gentiles to hope in him, not into this, the things of this world. Uh, also, God's using Christ saving his people and ruling over us in our hearts as well to bring Gentiles to hope in Christ. And third point, becoming a minister to help Gentiles hope in Christ and glorify God for his mercy will be successful because the, the verse just before the verse that Paul quoted says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, so the guarantee that this mission of Gentiles, bringing Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy will be successful. Okay, that's all. Sorry that was long. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, a lot of research there. And uh, anyway, just blessing to my heart too. The Isaiah 11 passage, uh, just I love. It's just so beautiful. Um, and the only other thing that popped in my head here, it's an interesting problem about because uh, Isaiah 11 does lead you in this millennial kind of direction, but I'm happy to do as you explained it, or even I'm happy to do like an already not, not already not yet concept there. So, you know, what we've seen, the reality of the last 2,000 years and what you see in Acts, the Gentiles accept, is like this foretaste of the fuller picture that the whole world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The whole world will come in knowledge. So, anyway, thank you. Blessing. Um, okay, we can take our five-minute break, and maybe while we, we do that, can I get anyone else who's planning to give their presentation to drop a note in here in the chat and let's make sure that we give time for each one of you there. So uh, just drop a note if you've got a presentation prepared and you're ready to present. And then we'll come back in here. Brother Kenneth, you can go next. Um, we'll come back here at 923. And then the only passing comment, and so Brother Kenneth and Brother Duncan will be great. Only other passing comment, I'll say it now before I forget it. Um, basically what you've just done turn around and turn that into, I mean, you know, what all of you are doing here with your presentations, you can turn that, turn around and turn that into your paper. Clearly, we just saw Dr. K's notes, you know, you've got all this information in there. It's not that much ready, not that much additional work to ready that up and have that as a completed paper. So anyway, great lesson. Okay, let's take a, a break, come back at 923, and then we'll go in that order. Brother Kenneth, Brother Duncan, and then, um, Brother Aguinaldo, just going in that order. And uh, if you each take 10 minutes, we'll be okay. So, all right, thanks a lot. Um, so I, uh, we, I picked the, the, probably the most, one of the most challenging texts in the whole of uh, the scriptures, Psalm 110, um, most quoted also. So uh, this, uh, is outline. We'll uh, look at the parallels in the 110, um, and then translated uh, 110 and looked at the, uh, the the Hebrew text as well as the Septuagint, then the quotations and then the allusions, uh, broken down into the three parts, and then the conclusion. Okay, so if we look at the um, the psalm itself, 
uh, as you know, I, I like to look at the parallels. Um, so you have both the ESE and the NIV here. Um, you'll find that sub verse 1 is uh, parallel with verse 5. Okay, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Uh, and then here you have the Lord is at your right hand. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, uh, he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Okay, and center will be uh, verse 4. Okay, let's, uh, so that's basically, uh, so if we read, uh, and, and I'll explain this later, when we look at verse 1, we really need to look at verse 5 as well. Okay, um, those are related. Uh, when we look at translations and uh, from the either the Masoretic text or the uh, Septuagint, it's basically, there's no difference. It's uh, almost word for word, um, identical. Uh, verbatim in uh, in all the in all the sections of the of this one verse, uh, so there's virtually no difference, and uh, so nothing to to uh, say that he they took from either preferred either text. Okay, so in this case, this is a very clear declaration by God, a decree by God, which is not supposed to be changed or amended. Okay, wherever you look at it. Um, okay, so I look at quotations first. And we find that it is quoted by Christ uh, in, in, the, in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, you have it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I, this, is the, this occurs in Jerusalem um, and uh, where the Pharisees, scribes, and all of them come and question Christ. And then he answers them. And then after that, he turns around and he asks them this question. Okay. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand um, until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Okay. That's uh, NASB. Sorry. Just a moment. Huh? Okay. Now, I'm just trying to move this around a bit. Let's see. Okay, so now the, uh, the, the obvious thing that you would probably think is here, Christ, what is Christ trying to do? Um, you know, most, the, the, the most common thing will, is that uh, people will say is that this, this, he uses this psalm to quote, uh, quotes this psalm to point, that, point out that he is uh, actually the Christ or that he is the Lord. Here. Um, but I think that is only part or half of the message because uh, it's the Lord saying to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies um, your foot soul. Okay? Um, so we, we move on here and look at the, the verse in parallel. So when you look at the verse in parallel, Psalm 1 and Psalm, uh, verse 1 and verse 5, okay, the Lord says to my Lord here, this is, this is identifying uh, the Lord Christ. Okay, um, sit at my right hand. Here is, and then here it is at your. The Lord is at your right hand. Okay, so you find that here, you notice that there is a progression. Uh, here, uh, the Lord, the Father says to the Son, "Sit at my right hand," and in verse five, the Lord is at uh, your right hand. Okay, so there is a progression here. And then uh, in verse, the second half of the verse, uh, until I make your enemies your footstool, uh, is, is really tied to this. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Okay. Um, so you find there's a progression. Uh, while verse 5 looks at the, the, the Lord's, in, in this command, uh, verse 1 is the command, but verse 5, okay, it is, is fulfilled. Um, it, this identifies Jesus as Lord, okay? And uh, so the making of your enemies, your footstool, okay, is fulfilled when the Lord shatters kings on the day of his wrath, okay? So, um, right. in, in other words, uh, this actually is um, 
this part is an exercise of his lordship. Okay. Um, and, and actually this, this section here is really eschatology, uh, is really speaking of the eschatos. Okay. At God's right hand, uh, Jesus will execute judgment. All right. Uh, it, we, we find this in Revelation 5, 7. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay, and in verse uh, Revelation 6, 1, then he opens the seals. So at the, when Christ is at the right hand of God, he is really going to execute judgment um, from there. And so this really is pointing towards uh, the judgment. Um, okay, next I looked at the quotations by the apostles. You'll find this in uh, Acts 2, uh, verse 34 to 35. It was when uh, Peter said this, uh, preached this to the Jews which were in Jerusalem. It was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my So it's again here, um, verbatim quotation. Um, same thing occurs in Hebrews 1, uh, 13. So in the Acts, Acts, uh, in the Acts 2, as you know, this was the preaching of Peter at St. Pentecost. Again, here he is pointing to the Christ, uh, pointing to Christ as the Lord, um, thus identifying him, and not only that, um, as uh, identifying him as the Messiah, as the Messiah, as uh, the direct from the direct lineage of David, who will sit on his throne. So, um, and, and deserves, and he will come again and, um, and judge. Okay, this, that's the second half of this verse, all right? That I will, I will make your enemies uh, your footstool, a footstool for your feet. Uh, in Hebrews uh, 1, chapter 1, uh, the whole section, actually 1 and 2, and quite a large portion of the front part, is all talking about, uh, you know, the excellency of Christ over the angels as uh, mentioned by uh, Gerard. So um, here again, you know, uh, he, he's comparing what he said, uh, the Lord, the Father says to the Son, said at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, he never says that to any of the angels. Okay. Um, okay, so now we'll look at the um, echoes and uh, allusions. All right, so I... I divide this into three parts. Uh, the first part is actually just a direct, where you have direct um, speech of the Father to the Son. So this is, identifies the Lord. Secondly, you have uh, sitting at my right hand, which is a, a place of glory. He's actually uh, given a place of honor. And thirdly, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is uh, this is where the Lord is avenged, or and or He exercises His uh, dominion, okay. And this is uh, we find that this is actually echoed all the way from Genesis all the way right to Revelation, okay. Um, how so? Well, now the idea of the Son um, exercising dominion starts actually really from uh, Genesis one. Uh, 26 from from the, uh, the the cultural mandate okay uh, god says let us make man okay which is uh, again uh, this is actually an allusion to son of man in our image after our likeness again this is the referring to the glory of god um and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea the birds of the heaven and over the livestock over all the earth so all creation and over every creeping thing. So you find here the three elements um, here, okay? Um, in, in the glory, uh, after all likeness, um, you know, if, we, if you recall 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, uh, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. So really the image of, uh, the man's image is really the glory of God, okay? Um, so you have down here again the, the formula that these three elements are here. Um, okay. Um, next, there you I we turn to Psalm eight, uh, where this part here, what is is quoted, 
the idea of man exercising dominion is repeated. Uh, same idea here. What is man that you are mindful of him, and a son of man, which again refers to Christ, that you care for him, you have, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor, and have given him dominion. So all, again, all the three elements are there. Okay. Now, um, quite clearly, this is again um, quoted again in, in Hebrews 2, right? Um, and at the end of verse, at the end of verse 8, okay, you have this, uh, the writer writes this, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control, okay? At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So in other words, this verse is really pointing us to the eschatos. The two, the two halves of it, the first half talks about him being at the right hand of God. Now that part is already fulfilled. But the, the second part, making putting everything in dominion under his foot, his enemies under his footstool, that part is referring to the eschatos or the day of the Lord. Okay, I'll move on. Um, and um, we find this verse uh, again talking about uh, this decree that God one will have uh, man rule over all creation, or rather the Son himself ruling all over, over all creation because uh, you have this verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 28, okay? when all things are subjected uh, to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Okay, so the idea here is that when all things, all creation, including the enemies, are subjected to the Son, then the Son will uh, can himself be subjected to the Father that God may be all in all. So this, um, um, you know, gives us God's uh, plan, really. You, you see down here God's plan from the very beginning when he established, when he did the creation in Genesis 1, 26, all the way uh, to be fulfilled in the Revelation. Okay? So in the Revelation, this decree, uh, you know, he, he, uh, you find that this decree, um, uh, that the, the lamb standing at the right hand, um, and he went and he took the scroll, uh, out the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, which is the Father. Um, so you have again here, the Lamb standing here is, Christ is identified, the Lamb of God. Uh, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand. So he's again honored. He's the only one. And then after this, you have all the worthy, is the Lamb uh, who, um, to, to take the scroll and open up the seals. And then finally, when the fire in, in the end of uh, Revelation, uh, he, fire comes down from heaven and consumes all his enemies. So you find here uh, in, in the book of Revelation, the fulfillment, a consummation of that, uh, of, that uh, of God's decrees. Okay. Um, okay, next I looked at, uh, okay, then I split this into the three parts. Um, and we, we find that uh, the, the direct um, communication between the Father and the Son is, uh, on, otherwise, uh, is also repeated in Psalm 2. Okay? In Psalm 2, you have, right, uh, in verse 7 to 9, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, okay, so here is, the, again, the direct, uh, alludes to this, this is a direct conversation between the Father and the Son. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So here is identification. Uh, sorry, this is the, said to me, is the, is the identification. You are my son is the glory, is, the, um, is, is uh, giving the son the honor that is due to him. Because uh, in uh, Middle Eastern um, culture, uh, the declaration of sonship uh, means that the, sorry, Can you all hear me? Okay. The yes. declaration of sonship um, effectively means that uh, the son has the same rights 
and authority as the father. Okay, so that is is uh, giving the son um, full rights um, and uh, a power and authority as the father. And then he in from verse eight and nine, I will uh, I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with raw iron and dash them in pieces. So again, here you have this. The, the three elements are there. Um, you have you have uh, the son, him identified, uh, him glorified, honored, and uh, all the nations really put under his control. Okay, so he's uh, uh, exercising his dominion in that position. Um, next, I move on to the sitting at my right hand. Now, sitting at my right hand, um, firstly, is uh, signifies power. Uh, the right hand, um, as this was mentioned a lot by uh, Kevin Oberlin, Dr. Oberlin, um, is associated with uh, the deliverance from Egypt. You find this in Exodus 15, 6. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Uh, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. This is the song of Moses uh, after they crossed the Red Sea. Okay. Um, so the right hand is, is um, you know, directly associated with power. Um, and again, down here, you, you have again the same three elements, um, uh, the, father, the Lord himself, the right hand, glorious in power, and then he's shattering the enemies. Uh, you find this again also in Ezekiel 20, verse 33. Uh, As I live, declares the Lord, and here is Adonai, Adonai um, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, okay, that's, that's the power, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. So this is, uh, the context here is that, um, you know, this verse was uh, written to Israel, uh, which was frequently called rebellious, rebellious uh, nation, rebellious uh, uh, people. And um, so this is, um, um, again, another here, uh, the same formula for the three elements are there as well. Okay, uh, the right the right hand is also associated with uh, the Messiah. In Psalm eighty verse fifteen, um, you have even the shoot, the root or branch. This again is uh, linked with the Messiah, which your right hand has planted, and on the Son, whom you have strengthened for yourself. In, again, in verse seventeen. Let your, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. So again, this all points against the Messiah. In Jeremiah 23 verse 5, uh, you have, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Again, this is uh, my saying language. And he will reign as king. So the honor is given to him. and act wisely, and do justice and righteousness in the land. So here, again, this part is an uh, um, exercise of his dominion, his, his power. Okay. Um, okay, we move on. The right hand is also associated with righteousness. Um, I will strengthen you, uh, as I, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Huh? Uh, again, down here, uh, uh, the... Uh, mention of righteousness again um, in Jeremiah 23 verse 5. So um, righteousness associated with power, with uh, his right hand associated with, with power, with righteousness, um, and also now um, linked uh, with the Messiah and with the Davidic covenant of us. Because uh, you have in the book of Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter refers um, multiple times uh, to identify the Lord as the Messiah. Okay, um, he quotes uh, from that. Uh, this is Psalm uh, 16. He quotes from Psalm 16. Okay, I saw the Lord, I don't know, always before me, for he is at, uh, sorry, this is, uh, will be curious. This is Greek. <laughs> uh, for he was at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also would dwell in hope, 
for you will not abandon my soul to hates or let your holy one see corruption so here you do have uh, again the three elements okay the lord is identified he is at my right hand of course here is uh, the right hand of david but um, the idea of the right hand again and then he will not abandon my soul to hades um and uh, or let your holy one see corruption and we know that if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the last enemy that is to be banished, uh, to be destroyed, is death. So even death here is, will be put under the feet of Christ. So um, this, it's in, in God's uh, decrees and plans, it's, it's, uh, it's comprehensive. It covers everything must be put under the feet of the Lord. Um, okay, uh, sitting at my right hand is also, again part the Davidic covenant uh, is mentioned numerous times that uh, uh, that uh, in uh, the next verse in, in chapter two verse thirty being a being therefore a prophet, knowing that God has sworn uh, sworn with an oath that to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Uh, so the throne is mentioned again, uh, referring to the kingly. Uh, referring to the kingly function of the Lord. Um, uh, this Psalm 132 verse 11 is actually the same thing. Uh, one of your sons is referring to the Davidic covenant. And um, in Isaiah 6.1, you have another reference here in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and here is uh, Adonai, sitting upon a throne. So he, the Lord was actually on the throne all along, um, even before his incarnation, high and lifted up. Okay, and then here in the, the next, the, the verse after that, in verse uh, Acts 2.33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. So this portion here confirms to us that Christ is uh, at the right hand of God right now um, and was before as well. Um, okay, so that person is identified, uh, Matthew 26, 64, here after you see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, uh, Ephesians, when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand, Colossians again, same idea, uh, Hebrews 1, 3, um, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand, uh, Hebrews again, you have the same thing, you have a high priest, who has taken his seat at the right hand. Um, and again, in, in uh, Acts 7, when uh, talking about Stephen's testimony, um, he looked up and he into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. So um, this ident confirms that the Christ is the one who is at the right hand. Um, finally, look at the last part until I make your enemies a footstool. Um, now, this uh, is echoed in the Hebrews 10, verse 12 and 13. Um, but he being offered one sacrifice for sins uh, for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Um, Right, and then um, Peter also quotes that in heaven is the angels, authorities, and powers are subject to him. Okay, uh, Peter from uh, chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven uh, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. So right now, um, in the heaven, in heaven, uh, all the angels and authorities are subject to him. Um, it's just that his enemies are not yet, um, not yet subject to him, which we, which we know will be in the eschatos. Okay, uh, here you have um, uh, reference to David in Psalm 18, 
where after he pursues my enemies he, I, and overtook them, I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. So here again, uh, David is a type of uh, Christ who, over, who um, destroys his enemies or overcomes them. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, 25, for he must reign until he has put uh, his enem all his enemies under his feet. Um, and then he put all things under the subjection. So you have that again uh, under his feet. Okay, let me finish off here. Right, so the, the, we have this another type here that not only is Christ going to reign, well, we as his people will reign with him. Okay, Joshua in uh, Joshua 10 verse 23, 24, uh, after they defeated the kings, Joshua called for the men of Israel and told them to put their feet on the necks of these kings. Uh, so they did that. Um, you know, and this is, uh, this is a type of what will happen. Um, Isaiah 49, 23, kings will be your guardians and their princes, princesses, your nurses, they will bow down to you and with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet. And you will know that I am the Lord. Again, in, six, in, in Isaiah 60 verse 14, the sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you and to those who despise you will, uh, will bow themselves at the soles of your feet. So numer numerous places are, are referenced and uh, um, are quote, uh, alluded to. Okay, so to summarize, um, Psalm 110 verse one is probably well, is I think the most probably the most quoted, apart from the Psalm two. Um, five times in verbatim as and it's at the decree of God. Uh, it is parallel to verse 5, and that speaks of the judgment from God's right hand. Okay, The thing is, uh, Christ is already at God's right hand, right now. So in terms of, if, if we're looking at the, at the timeline and the, the scheme of things, um, you know, Christ can come any time. And uh, see, only the day of the Lord remains. So that uh, basically is a warning to us, you know, that the judge stands at the door. You have this formula that the Lord is identified, that he is honored, he is at the right hand, granted power, and that he will judge or is ruling. Uh, this is repeated, constant theme that is repeated from Genesis all the way to Revelation, okay? So the Lord is the Christ, the Messiah, the root of and branch of David. He is at the right hand and he has the power to work salvation and righteousness. And everything in heaven, earth, and the seas must bow to him so that God may be all in all. And that concludes my presentation. Great. Thank you. If you're able to um, drop in the PowerPoint, maybe on Dropbox or give us a link or send it to me and I can put it up. Um, great. Thank you. Okay. Duncan, thank you very much, Brother Kenneth. Duncan, it's, uh, the time is yours. Okay. Well, um, uh, thank, yeah, thanks so much, Kenneth. Uh, that was awesome. Um, uh, you know, we were supposed to do a couple intertextual passages and you did like the whole Bible, which is awesome. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, I am going to try to, uh, be brief. I, I told Joel privately in the chat, I think part of the challenge with this is there's so much involved in these intertextual passages that it's kind of impossible to be brief, but I will try. Um, I just put a link in the chat to my notes, which uh, I was gonna put on the screen. Give me a, okay, here we go. Uh, is everyone seeing that okay? Looks great. Okay. And, um, uh, and if you're having trouble seeing the text on the left or the right, please just throw something into the chat. I can zoom uh, these things at, at any more than I as needed, but um, 
hopefully it's pretty good. Okay, uh, so my passage that I chose was Romans 9.13, uh, which is right here. Uh, uh, I was a little bit desperate looking for a text to choose for, for this project, and so I just picked a difficult one. Um, and uh, so it, it's a quotation from Malachi 1, 2, and 3, which is less familiar. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau's Jacob's, Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, <coughs> excuse me, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. So there's your quotation or your original context in Malachi. And I'm going to try to basically work through this using the method that Beale has in his handbook. Um, although along the way, uh, I don't know that I'm following him quite as precisely as he would recommend. So first, uh, looking at the context in Romans 9, um, just to place that in the big structure of Romans, I've got an outline uh, of Romans here on the right side of the screen. And this is uh, from Moo's shorter book, Encountering the Book of Romans. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it's helped me. I, I'm pretty confident that this reflects the outline in his big commentary as well. So Romans, of course, you have the opening that goes up to verse 17, uh, the, the theme statement of the letter, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, and I can't remember the rest of the quote, but you you're familiar with that text. Then we have the, the section of Romans that is uh, probably the first thing that jumps into our minds when Paul explains and expounds the gospel. And Mu um, call, separates uh, uh, up to chapter 4 as what he calls the heart of the gospel, justification by faith. In chapters 5 through 8, he then moves to the topic of assurance, uh, the hope that believers have on the basis of justification. And then in chapters 9 through 11, he transitions into something that, uh, in, in many ways, as Gentile readers of Romans, we maybe wouldn't anticipate. But it's a logical um, uh, next step for Paul. Uh, because his audience is dealing with um, just the transition between God's work uh, amongst national Israel, and now God has made the gospel available to the, to the Gentiles. So our passage is right here at the beginning of this section where we are dealing with, well, what about Israel? And um, let me just bring up the text for you. Uh, this is a document I used for teaching from the book of Romans. So I've got the text here. I've got Moo's outline embedded, and then I've got all kinds of notes along the way. One thing um, that is, and, and I managed to get this into my document here, but uh, the intertextual connections in Romans 5 through 8 are not super frequent. Um, so I was, I was trying to note those uh, several years ago when I put this together with little bracketed cross references that are hyperlinked in blue. You don't see a lot of them here in chapter eight. Then uh, it starts to pick up as you get into this last section. Um, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, <clears throat> but then when you get into Romans nine, uh, the intertextual connections just explode. And I'm only looking at one of them today, but they're all over. So um, Romans 9.13 comes in this section. We'll look at right here in a second. But the whole thrust of Romans 9 through 11 is introduced in verses 1 through 5. He says, uh, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain. And then he lists all of these blessings that are uh, Israel's due to their uh, covenant relationship with God. They have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, the service of God, the promises, 
uh, from them that we get the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. And, um, uh, you know, you, you can just stop right there and praise God for all of that. But there is this question, well, then what, how do we, how do we uh, address the, the uh, expansion of the gospel to all nations? and the relationship to God's promises to Israel. So in the next section here, verses 6 through 13, Paul starts to define his, what he means by the promise. And he talks about election. And let me just bring the outline up again here. Uh, there it is. Okay, so um, you have verses 6 through 13, and then towards the end of chapter 9, you have a, a section that Mu had heads as God's calling of a new people, Israel and the Gentiles. And there's a sense in which um, this section, verses 6 through 13, and verses 24 through 29, seem to be in parallel. It, it almost appears as though um, verses 14 through 23 is like a center section in an inclusio or a chiastic kind of arrangement. Um, I have a quote here for you in these notes. This is Mark Seifried who wrote the uh, section in the commentary on the New Testament use of the old. And he does something interesting here. I don't ultimately take his approach. He, he sees verses, um, this opening section as a lament. And um, <clears throat> so he uh sorry and that he's taking verses one through five as the lament not verses six through 13 i just forgot where my notes were heading and then down in verse 27 he picks up again um where it says isaiah also cries out concerning israel and then they have all these quotes down to the end of the chapter he says that's a lament that wraps up the chapter and i think i think there's some um structural maybe chiasm or inclusio at the beginning and the ending going on here but i don't think it's lament and uh you can look at my, these notes uh if you if that interests you i think this is all diatribe i think this is all argument and verses uh six through 13 he's introducing this principle um that supports uh or that is going to be supported later on in the chapter. And so then verses 14 through 23, he's responding to objections that you would naturally raise from the principle he introduces here in this section. Okay, um, uh, let me just see here. Um, so here's his principle. It is not that the word of God has taken no effect. And he makes a very important point in the next phrase. He says, they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. And that principle is something that he probably alluded to in Romans 2.28. Um, I won't go there for sake of time, but there's a link, I think, to that text. Um, and then he says in verse eight, 8, making it clear, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. And, and so he is able to use that to distinguish between uh, Abraham's children according to the flesh, of whom there are several, and Jacob, who is the child of promise. Um, so then uh, we come to uh, Jacob in verse 10. Uh, not only this, but when Rebecca had also conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, the children not yet being born, are having done any good and evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, and here is where Paul introduces the text from Malachi, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, let's go look at Malachi. Um, I have a Logos window with that text. I've not done a document um, with that. Let me see if I can, oops, make the text a little bigger in here. There is a way to do this. Uh, there it is. 
Okay. And uh, okay, there you go. Okay, so Malachi, uh, of, oh, that it was my attempt at being on time. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep going and try to be fast. Okay. Um, Malachi is a, a, I tend to think of it as just one of the minor prophets, and that's probably my own error. Um, early Christians and the Jews valued it a lot. Um, Tertullian described it as the link between Judaism and Christianity. And uh, uh, one of my commentaries had these quotes from ancient Jewish sources that called it the seal of the prophets, the last among them. So it was actually put there at the end of the 12, partly because it sort of brings together a lot of themes and, and was highly regarded by the uh, ancient Jews themselves. It is structured around several messages and um, there's a little debate about uh, this term here because Malachi could be translated my messenger. There's another reference, I think, uh, later in the book where the term is used possibly to reference just to the messenger of the Lord. And so there's a question, is this a personal name or is this just a, a reference? It, you can kind of go either way, but what is conclusive is this is a post-exilic message and it, it's given by a prophet in the land of promise um, <clears throat> and it's also possible that there was a person named Malachi who delivered these oracles although may, perhaps someone else wrote them down so you have six prophetic speeches in the book of Malachi and then you have at the very end um, there is a concluding summary so Malachi 4 4 through 6 right here in the notes, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. I'll stop reading it right there. But the two main themes that um, come out throughout the book of Malachi are the importance of keeping the law. Remember the law of my servant Moses. And um, the great and awesome day of the Lord that is coming. So the people of Israel are to prepare for that day. And, um, and uh, this was an interesting thing. Um, I got this from uh, Doug Stewart's commentary uh, in the uh, three-volume set, but edited by McComiskey. There are a ton of passages in Malachi the, where he's pronouncing a curse upon the people, and that curse reflects some curse in the uh, in the Davidic, or sorry, in the Pentateuch. So again, remember the law, and he's showing that if you don't remember the law, these are the consequences. Verse, uh, the first speech is short. It's verses two through five. This is where we get our text that Paul quotes. Uh, which I read to you just a minute ago, comes right at the bridge between verse 2 and verse 3. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Um, and so there's, there's sort of an interesting dialogue going on here. It just starts out with the statement from the Lord, I have loved you. The uh, listener responds, how have you loved us? The Lord responds by pointing out a truth. Esau is Jacob's brother. Yet, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And then he applies that to uh, a context of judgment. I have laid waste his hill country. And then, he, and then if Edom is going to say, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord says, they may build, but I will tear it down. They will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. And then he speaks again to his audience, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord. So the message is that God is faithful to his promises. God's love towards Israel is a, is a covenantal love that is uh, specific, exclusionary, and um, this will be seen in the way that God works in history. So the way that God judges Edom is going to be a lesson to Israel, teaching them about God's exclusionary love for them. Um, there are a lot of passages in the prophets, um, jumping over to this bullet here, that refer to the judgment on Edom. And uh, so, so many commentaries uh, 
and interpreters believe that you can see Edom as a synecdoche for all of Israel's enemies. Uh, and there's some there's some significance to that because, of course, they were close historically, geographically. They are also, you know, genealogically related back to Abraham through Esau. So there's a special way in which they function as Israel's enemies. And so there's uh, something really startling that goes on here in Malachi. Now, the big question in these texts is not. Um, it's not so much about textual variation or, you know, is this uh, actually a quote in the New Testament? It's obviously a quote. But the big question is, what on earth do we do with this love and hate relationship? And uh, I'm not going to solve that for you today, probably, but I'll give you some things that I've found, and I hope this will be helpful. So um, in this context, when, when it says, I have loved Jacob. The idea of love is related to the idea of election. You, Deuteronomy 7, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And I believe in verse 8, let me just pull this up. Um, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out uh, from the land of Egypt. So the love that God has towards Israel is related to the idea of election, that God has chosen them out of all of the nations. It also is related to redemption. Um, you see that a little bit here in verse 8, that he's delivered them out of the land of Egypt. You also have texts like Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Of course, that is used by Matthew and Matthew 2 as well. Um, so, there's this very strong exclusionary delivering love towards Jacob, and on the other hand, in contrast, uh, we see that Esau is hated, and um, uh, this goes against uh, normal social convention for the time Esau was the older son. Um, and you have references in Genesis to the fact that uh, Esau's parents, Isaac and Rebekah, you know, have some affection towards Esau. So it's a, it's a striking thing for God to say that he hates uh, Esau. Um, now, another thing that we have to keep in mind when we think about Jacob and Esau, God's feelings toward them are not based on the fact that Jacob was a good guy and Esau was a bad guy. Right? We're familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau, and, and for quite a bit of the Jacob story, he's not a very nice guy. His name is aptly deserved. Um, and so this highlights the sovereignty of God. His love and his hatred, however we understand that term, are uh, made, uh, are, is, is an expression of his own sovereign choice. Um, another thing to, to just set in mind in our thinking here, we shouldn't think of this in a modern human psychology sense per se. These are different terms in Hebrew and Greek. There uh, may be a different connotation. Um, and uh, Stewart also points out this language was sometimes used by kings in treaties to describe foreign alliances. So uh, your ally is someone you love, your enemy is someone you hate. Uh, as a perhaps really, uh, take it or leave it, a bit, perhaps a bad illustration of this, um, I'm a fan of a particular sports team, um, the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, I like hockey because I'm Canadian. And I actually live uh, a long way away from Edmonton now. I live in the territory of the Carolina Hurricanes. And uh, everyone at work thinks it's hilarious that I hate the Carolina Hurricanes. And the only reason I hate them is because I live here. And uh, some people have asked me, well, why couldn't you be a fan of the Carolina Hurricanes too, like your local team and your team team? And I'm just like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't be a fan of one team and also be a fan of another team. Like, it's a competitive sport. 
and and the competition doesn't work if uh, if you can if you love two teams. I don't know if that perfectly works for the text here, but it, the idea of these foreign alliances and loving your allies and hating your enemies just prompted that in my mind. Um, it, and uh, substitute whatever sports team you value. Uh, if that helps you, uh, uh, it helps me a little bit. Uh, I didn't find um, a lot of examples of uh, early Jewish exegesis of Malachi 1, but I'm also not certain, maybe I just missed something, um, and, and I, this is uh, like a, a place where I just feel un unprepared, honestly, to, to evaluate that, and I need the commentaries. Um, let's look at the text now in close up. In the Greek, uh, there are very few significant factors. Most of them don't affect our interpretation. The most significant one is perhaps the fact that Paul varies the word order ever so slightly. Um, so here's Romans 9.13, kathos gegraptai, uh, just as it has been written, ton Jacob, Jacob, Hega Pesa, I have loved, Ton de Hesaw, Esau, Emisesa, I have hated. Uh, and then in Malachi, you have Kai, and then notice you have Ega Pesa first. And I have loved the Jacob, the Esau, I have hated. So you have the same word order for the Esau clause, oops, sorry, in, in both passages, but in the Isaac or Jacob clause, you have a word order variation. And, um, oh, uh, I just saw Joel's note about the wife thing. I mean, I, there's a sense in which that's true, but I'd be sure careful using it uh, in a pulpit. Um, if you're speaking to a mixed audience, that might get you in trouble. That's all I'll say about that. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, Jake, what I think is going on here, the, the Septuagint is reflecting the word order of the Greek. I've got a picture of the, or sorry, of the Hebrew. I've got a picture of the Hebrew text here. Neum Yahweh. Wa achov eth Yaakov. Wa eth nyesu. Hang on a second. Saneati. Saneti. My Hebrew is a little, I, I, I struggle. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the Septuagint reflects the Hebrew word order. I think there's uh, some Hebrew chiasm going on here. Jacob and Esau in the center, the verbs on the outside. Um, and what I think is happening here, the, the Septuagint is perfectly quote, translating in a very formal way the Hebrew, all right, I really need to hustle now, but I'm almost done the useful stuff, I think. Um, I think Paul is intentionally altering the quotation just a little bit, and that's because of his own emphasis that he wants to make. He wants to emphasize the, the continued role and position of Israel, of Jacob, and so he bumps Jacob to the front for emphasis. Uh, that's all I can make out of that textual difference there. And it's a little bit hard to conclusively prove, but it's a really interesting shift, especially given how uh, closely parallel the Septuagint and the Hebrew are. There are some other textual variants that I annotated there for you, but they, um, uh, they are, are not uh, the significant kind. There's a misspelling of emi sesa in the text of Romans and a couple manuscripts um, and some things like that. Uh, okay, so Paul's use of Malachi 1, I, I just want to suggest here that there is a, there is possibly a shift um, in semantic significance. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's it's almost conclusive that in Malachi, uh, this I have loved Jacob and Esau I have hated is primarily talking about God's working in salvation history. And so he's talking about the judgment that is going to be carried out on national Edom and the way that God will fulfill his promises to national Israel. 
um, obviously there are uh, there are implications there for individual salvation, but Malachi one is not primarily concerned with individual es uh, soteriology. It is primarily concerned, I think, with uh, soteriology on a grand salvation history redemptive scale. Okay, uh, back to Romans. This is where this gets difficult uh, theologically because Paul appears to be applying this at least in a, to a certain extent in an individual sense. Um, and uh, 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 the commentaries, of course, are on both sides of that question. Some insist no, Romans 9 is purely a national reference. Um, and uh, I've got this long quote from Schreiner here for you to read his commentary. Uh, he makes so many interesting points, it was just hard to edit them. But um, I'll just go to this bold part here. He says, I have argued that the issue in the context of Romans is salvation. And by that, he means individual salvation. Even if the Old Testament texts about Esau and his descendants merely concern their temporal destiny. He's, uh, he says, we have already seen that Malachi 1, 2 through 5 confirms the idea that Edomites were outside the people of God, and this text does not seem to relate only to temporal displeasure, since it says that Yahweh's anger is upon them forever. So I think the difficulty that we have in this text is that uh, uh, both ideas are sort of in some kind of relationship. Um, Paul is writing with respect to individual salvation and the um, the relationship that the works of the law have to do with that. And so I think that Paul is taking the text, emphasizing the individual element, partly by moving Jacob to the front of the quote, and partly as it fits into the grand scheme of his whole argument here. Um, and part of the reason that I think it's important for us to read it that way is that the misapplication of that idea is what he addresses in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Which would be a logical conclusion from the idea that God in his sovereignty is uh, electing some and something else, others, right? Um, and he says, certainly not. And then he gives, uh, he refers us back to references to God's sovereign mercy. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Uh, and then he gives the example of Pharaoh. There's so many things going on in this text, but I think we can say, it's just to try to, try to wrap it all together, that this is highlighting the fact that, that God is free to make his choice, and he's free in both of these settings. Um, and it's uncomfortable for us, but it also drives us to praise him, seeing as uh, we can have confidence through the work of the Spirit in our hearts and lives that we are the ones on whom he's had mercy. Um, the theological ramifications of this keep going, and I hope this is encouraging and provocative for you uh, and really enjoyed studying this and there's so much more to do. Uh, that's all from me. Great. Okay. Thank you. The notes that you have there, uh, there's way more than we can, anyway, certainly we can work through that information as we have time. So lots more there to look at. Thank you for compiling all that, pulling that together. Lots and lots of information there. And you see that link in the chat as well. Um, okay, so here's what we'll do. I mean, we're 25 minutes past. Um, I completely understand if you need to go. No worries. What we can do, Brother Aguinaldo, if you go ahead and share what you've got here, and uh, certainly those of us that are able to stay, great. Uh, I'll record it, and so it'll be available that way, so somebody can watch it later. Um, so anyway, completely understanding someone who needs to go for work or um, just the lateness of the hour if you're here in Southeast Asia, completely understanding that. 
uh, we'll just continue on with Brother Aguinaldo, and then as others uh, later, if you want, are able to watch, then that'll be posted, and so you can pick it up there. So, okay, thank you all, uh, and thank you very much, Brother Duncan, and we'll look forward to hearing what we have here from Brother Aguinaldo, what you're able to share with us here. So, the time is yours. Okay, good evening. Let me Okay. Uh, thank you very much for those people who shared. Wait a minute. I think the uh, this a minute. Uh, on in Luke chapter twenty four, verse four to six in connection with the Old Testament. And uh, if you're, you have your Bible, you can read it. The Bible says in that, verse 46 in Luke chapter 24, verse 26, Jesus said, and said unto them, thus it is written, thus it be who Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Okay? Uh, the central theme of the message of the New Testament is undoubtedly uh, okay. the story about the resurrected Christ. All of the poor gospel ends with it. The book of Acts also revolves on the preaching and declaring of this very message. And all the doctrine presented in Paul and other epistles, other epistles hold on its truth. The hope of all the New Testament believers is the coming of the resurrected Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 9 to 11 other verses. The Bible does not only declare that Jesus rose from the grave. It strongly they asserted that Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. Paul made it clear that the gospel is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 and 4. The third day resurrection was mentioned in the Lord Jesus as a sign in John, John chapter 2, verse 19, as he was challenged by the hearers to prove his claim. And 13 times as a prophetic declaration in his private conversation with his disciple, I intentionally excluded Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, because I personally believe that it is not in line with this third day slogan. It is worth noting here that he made this declaration and uh, declaration and introduces this new truth that he will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day when his disciples were already convinced that he is the Messiah. And you can read that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, uh, about the, after the declaration of Apostle Peter says that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, and he made this statement. Another one observation we may point out is that this third day language seems to be absent in John's gospel except in John chapter 2 verse 19. One of the utterances by the Lord Jesus Christ with this third day language is focus of our case study today. Luke chapter 24 verse 46. This he uttered on the same day he was resurrected from the dead. As he explained from the scriptures, the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, the Christ will suffer and raise from the dead the third day. Paying closing attention to the wording of the passage, it shows that Jesus Christ was making a connection between his third day resurrection on the Old Testament writings. The passage reads, Thus it is written, and rise from the dead the third day. It is the first time that this third day resurrection was connected to the Old Testament. The second is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Actually, that is the only two verses that connect the third uh, day resurrection from the dead that we can find in the scriptures. Uh, if you're going to study about the two witnesses, these two uh, verses authenticate the truthfulness of these uh, claims. The Old Testament presented clearly that Jesus will suffer, die, be raised from the dead, from the dead. There are lots of passages, Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, Psalm 16, verse 10, are some of examples of this prophecy. But looking thoroughly throughout the Old Testament, 
we will learn that there is no direct Old Testament passage that prophesied or mentioned that the Messiah will rise from the dead or from the grave the third day. So where and how can we find the Old Testament reference that pertains to Jesus Christ's resurrection on the third day, as he stated in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. In this presentation, I will offer two possible ways we can make a connection between Luke chapter 24, verse 46, uh, verse 46, and the Old Testament writings. By looking on how the old, number one is by looking how the Old Testament did use this abebral phrase, the third day, and how these verses can be related to Jesus Christ's resurrection. That Bebrel phrase, the third day, was mentioned 36 times in the Old Testament. Notice 36 verses, the closest verse in which we can make a connection to the third day resurrection language is found in Isaiah chapter 6, which is also the last verse in the Old Testament. And this prophecy uh, this prophecy was proclaimed by the prophet Hosea to the backsliding Israel in Judah. The promise of the resurrection or resurrection will come to Israel on the third day if they will repent. This is somewhat an obscure verse and can only be good reference if we will combine all the Old Testament verses that mention about the third day. Looking to these 36 verses, there is a recurring idea and motive that this third day language is presenting in the Old Testament that is that connects to what Jesus Christ is saying. It is about the shortness of time. That is number one. In this very short time, Jesus was risen from the grave as he promised according to the scriptures. But more interestingly, there is a seemingly a progressive truth that is being built this three day phrase in the Bible uh, in connection to God's divine plan of salvation which culminated to Jesus Christ's resurrection. In the New Testament this adverbal phrase the third day was mentioned 16 times. In 14 out of 16 verses we'll find out that it always qualifies the verb raise or rise and it always in relation to Jesus' resurrection. Looking to all these 56 verses we'll see this progressive truth. Plus, uh, that is the uh, uh, verses in the New Testament. So this is how it flows. It implies shortness of time, a period of shortness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, it is about the uh, bringing forth of the, uh, the grass and um, the trees. So it brings light. In the shortness of time, there is the bringing of light. Esther chapter 14, verse 16, and John chapter 2, verse 15 is talk about uh, this same thing. Jesus Christ says, destroy this temple and in, the, in three days I will rise it up. It means in the short period of time, he will do it. Secondly, it implies bringing forth of light and fruitfulness. Mentioned a while ago in verse, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, uh, uh, it is a time when the Lord made the grass to uh, uh, to bring forth grass out of the barren land. First Kings chapter three verse eight is about the uh, the presentation of uh, the first case that was presented to King Solomon about the two ladies. Uh, first Kings chapter three verse eighteen speak about the timing of the birth of the second uh, mother that gave birth. It was mentioned on the third day. This lady or this woman. Gave birth. So it implies bringing forth of life and fruitfulness. Also, it implies judgment. Genesis chapter 34, verse 1 to 6 is about uh, the judgment that brought uh, that uh, Simeon and Levi brought to the uh, uh, inhabitants of uh, Hebites uh, that, that, that uh, violate their sister. Uh, Dina. Genesis chapter 40, ver, uh, 40 verse 20 is about uh, the judgment after the third day of the king of Pharaoh. Uh, there is judgment that was brought to the uh, uh, the baker and the freedom that was brought uh, bring, uh, that was given to the battle. Fourthly, it implies confirmation of promise. 
Exodus chapter 19, verse 11 and 15 is about the first covenant. Uh, on the third day, the Lord, on the third day, the Lord met uh, uh, the children of Israel and gave them uh, the Ten Commandments of their words. It implies hope and deliverance. If you're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 42, verse 18, Numbers chapter 19, verse uh, 12 and 19, speak about uh, there is a, 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 a message that implies deliverance. It also implies completion. Ezra chapter 6, verse 15 is about the completion of the second temple on the third day of the month of Adar. It also implies new beginning. John chapter 2, verse 1 is about the new uh, beginning of the marriage of the two uh, of, uh, in Canaan. An old reference about the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day, it implies a new beginning. And lastly, it implies good news. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 2 is about the news that uh, uh, one of the servants of, uh, after the battle of the Amalekites, uh, that one servant met, uh, went to David and proclaimed that uh, his enemy soul was dead. So it, it implies good news. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 is the same manner. Uniting these 52 verses, 36 from the Old Testament, 16 in the New Testament passage, which can arrive at the fuller meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day to the scripture as it is written. The resurrection of the third day of the Lord Jesus Christ implies in the shortness of time, Christ brought life, fruitfulness, hope, deliverance, judgment to those who reject him and will, will reject him. Confirm the promise, complete his redemptive work, and offer good news to all. On the other hand, there's another way that we can find a possible Old Testament solution of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. And it is the peace of the Passover, or the unleavened, peace of the living bread, and the peace of the first fruit. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is clearly associated and is in line with the death, with the date and timing of the peace of the Passover, or the peace of unleavened bread, and the peace of the first fruit. Paul used the Passover lamb as a typology of Jesus as our Passover lamb. In, uh, in the New Testament, there are four passages which alludes that Jesus Christ was the first fruit, which was foreshadowed by the first fruit that was offered during the peace of the first fruit. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 34, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 is speaking, is talking about Jesus Christ as uh, the first fruit from the, from the dead or the begotten from the dead, and so on. All these four verses echo the peace of the first fruit and the peace, uh, uh, peace of the first fruit and the first fruit offering and were intentionally and in unintentionally connected by the writer to the resurrection from the dead of our Lord. Jesus Christ from the grave. Because of this obvious connection and how the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day happened exactly on the first, on the day of the first fruit, it is of great importance that we account the dating of this event properly. We need to answer the account and account properly the date of the first fruit in the Bible. I personally believe that the proper interpretation of this event are the link that connects with the third day resurrection language read in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, as mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. The passage to be studied is Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4, 11, and Exodus chapter 12, verse 15 to 16. But there is a problem text, verse 11. Looking on Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4, 11, the date or even the time of the killing of the Passover, as well as the date of the beginning of the first, the piece of the unleavened bread was clearly stated in the scripture. Exodus chapter 6, verse uh, 12, verse 6, and Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5 to 8. Uh, it was mentioned about the time when they are going to kill the Passover lamb. It must be killed at the even or 3 p.m. of the 14th day of the month of Nisan. 
the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually begins on the last meal of the day, uh, of the 14th day, or the evening of the 15th day of the same month, Nisa, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 6 to 7. The unclear date is the Feast of the First Fruit. The only hint that was given is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 11, in the phrase, tomorrow after the Sabbath. Two interpretation. For millennia, this statement, tomorrow after the Sabbath, found in this passage, has become a subject of great debate, dating from before the Christ, dating up to our time. This problematic passage has been interpreted differently by two religious group parties in time of Christ, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees interpret the Sabbath mentioned in the Bible chapter 23, verse 11 to 15, of chapter verse 11, especially, tomorrow after the Sabbath, as the first day of the unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Nisan. Reading on the passage, we saw that uh, day 15, or the first day of the unleavened bread, is a holy convocation, which no several work will be done. Maybe it is because the convict uh, the day of convocation, that vacation day, was also considered as Sabbath in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 to 44, uh, about the other uh, feast or uh, the feast that was mentioned in that verse. Comparing the 15th as a holy convocation to the other feast days that was referred to the holy convocation mentioned in verse 23 to 44, where no servile work should be done as, as Sabbath, aside from the regular Sabbath, one can conclude that the phrase found in Leviticus chapter 23, 11 was referring to the 15th or the first day of the living bread. So the dating will follow. 14 is the day where they are commanded to kill the Passover lamb, 3 p.m. At it, uh, 6 p.m., 15. It is the beginning of the feast of the unleavened bread. That is the time when they eat the unleavened bread plus the uh, uh, roasted uh, lamb. In the 16th, is the feast of the first fruit. That is how uh, these datings will follow according to the interpretation of the Pharisees. With this in line of interpretation, the feast of the first fruit will always be on the 16th. But falls, but can only fall, but can fall on any day of the week. Looking to this line of interpretation, we can simply say that the feast of the first fruit, as being the third day, is closely related to the third day of resurrection mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Because the first day is the 14th, uh, the killing of the Passover where Jesus Christ was di died. The 15th is the beginning of the first, uh, the living bread where Jesus Christ was buried. The 16th is where Jesus Christ was being raised from the dead. But let us also consider the other side of the interpretation of this problematic text. The Sadducees interpret this very differently. They interpret this tomorrow after the Sabbath as a regular Sabbath. Contrary to the Pharisees' interpretation. This means that the feast of the first fruit would fall on the different day as the year go by, but we also always fall on the first day of the week. We're going to wrap the dating. 14th day is the day where they kill the Passover lamb at 3 p.m. The 15th is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After the regular Sabbath, which day it is, the first is the day of the first fruit, Sunday. It always falls on the first day of the week or Sunday. The question is, which is right? The big question in which, inter which interpretation will be the proper accounting on the third day? These two cannot be both right. Only one will hold the water or properly accounting the third day connection to the Old Testament. If we will compare the day of Jesus, the day Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again, as per narrated in the gospel. Here, we will encounter another problem. If we will compare the synoptic gospel account Matthew chapter 16, Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 22, to John accounting, John chapter 3, John chapter 18, 19, uh, of the, uh, the Passion Week, in which we don't have time to discuss. This is a scenario where this can be both, this both 
interpretation can fall on the same dating. This is a scenario. These two different interpretations can only be accidentally or providentially be correct if one will hold on the narration found in Gospel of John and have a valid biblical historical explanation. Why does it not, why does it not take Gospel account on this day differently? Because the timing will be this. The timing of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection according to giant narration will go in line with the Pharisees and the Sadducees' interpretation. 14 of Nisan was killed, Jesus Christ was crucified the sixth day of, or Friday. 15 of Nisan, piece of the uh, unleavened bread, Jesus being buried from the dead, Sabbath day, Saturday. 16 of Nisan, piece of the first fruit, Jesus early in the morning rose from the grave, first day of the week. But it will have a different effect if one will follow the synoptic narration of the Passion Week. Different effect than uh, the synoptic narration. This dating will be different. It will follow the narration of the synoptic and somewhat go against the interpretation of the Pharisee and the translation that we, can, we will find in the Septuagint in, uh, in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 11. The timing of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection according to the synoptic narration will be as follows. 14 of Nisan, Passover was killed. Jesus did Passover with the disciples, Thursday. 15 of Nisan, Jesus of Unleavened Bread, Jesus was crucified, Friday. 16 of Nisan, Jesus was buried on the grave, Saturday. 17 of Nisan, Peace of the First Food, Jesus, early in the morning, rose from the grave, the first day of the week. We're going to follow this, this, this dating, the interpretation of the Pharisees in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 23, will not follow. I believe the link that solved the connection and connect these two events with Luke chapter 24, verse 46 is this. Number one, all the New Testament reference that connects the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the feast of the first fruit paints the picture of the resurrection from the grave. It means the resurrection of the body from the grave. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruit of them that sleep. Acts chapter 26, verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that she should be the first that should be raised from the dead. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Revelation chapter uh, 1, verse 15. And from, G and from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the king of the earth, and to, and to him that loved us, washed us from our sin in his blood. All these verses is pertaining on Jesus' resurrection from the grave. All of the post-resurrection declaration of Jesus' resurrection has an image of resurrection from the grave. Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, Mark chapter 16, verse 6, Luke chapter 24, verse 5 and 7, John chapter 21, verse 14, Acts chapter 10, verse 14. Looking closely to the core gospel narration, Jesus' burial started at 6 p.m. and finished around 6 at uh, 3 a.m. after the crucifixion. So the accounting, accounting this third day resurrection will give us this scenario according to the gospel narration. 14th of Nisan, Passover was killed. Jesus was crucified first day. 15th of Nisan, the piece of unleavened bread, he was buried around 6 to 3 a.m. Sixth day, Friday. 16th Nisan, Jesus was on the grave, Sabbath day, second day. 17th of Nisan, piece of the first book, Jesus early in the morning, rose from the grave, first day of the week. That is the third day. Comparing, comparing this piece of a living bread and the piece of the piece of the first book, as explained in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15 to 16, will give us the third day resurrection link. You can read it as you go along. So the first day in, in this passage, the first day of a living bread is 15. 
Jesus was buried Friday. Second day, the living bread. Nisan, 16 of Nisan, Jesus was in the grave Saturday. The third day, and living bread, 17, Nisan, the feast of the first food, Jesus rose from the grave. The Passover lamb was sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan, the fifth day of the week, according to the scripture. Third day, Thursday, the feast of unleavened bread, home on the sixth day of the week, Friday. Feast of the first food holds on the third day of unleavened bread, the first day of the week, Sunday, which is the first instituted of the first instituted Passover in the Bible. And the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ providentially fall on the same day week when the first Passover lamb was killed. Conclusion. This big it is a big possibility that the Old Testament passage Jesus and Paul referring that pertains to the third day resurrection has something to do with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the First Food, in which two divine provision acts happen in exact day Jesus was buried and rose again. I personally believe that the right interpretation of Leviticus chapter 23, verse 11, tomorrow after the Sabbath, which linked Luke chapter 24, verse 26. On the Old Testament writing is referring to the regular Sabbath for the following reason. Number one, as we read Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus 23 verse 3 is referring to the regular Sabbath, the establishing of the regular Sabbath. Then why interpret verse 11 as a regular Sabbath when this regular Sabbath was first mentioned in verse 44, uh, 24 to verse 44. The context itself, verse 23 to uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16, is referring to the seventh regular Sabbath that culminates to the uh, Pentecost. Verse 11 should be a regular Sabbath as well. The Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, and Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, mentioned that Jesus is the Passover lamb. The unleavened bread, the first fruit that foreshadowed this event. Number four, the New Testament teaching pictures in mind the resurrection from the grave on the third day. It means the resurrection of the body from the third day. Uh, that, those are the passages Matthew chapter 28, 6, Luke chapter 24, verse 5 and 6. Another passage in the, old, uh, in the New Testament. Number five, the timing of Jesus' burial. His own prophecy and statement that he will rise on the third day and the other verses in the New Testament will help us connect when Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to other Old Testament feasts mentioned in Leviticus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4 to 16. Number four, the timing of Jesus' death as narrated to, on the four gospel is in line to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 11 to verse 15. Especially, and uh, I have no battery here. Okay, so for verse twenty-six is the event that transpired in the day where he was crucified. The peace of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruit as well. That ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience and time for giving this presentation. Thank you for presenting. Uh, I think, as you said, there was some work that you had done on that uh, previously and some investment on that. Um, hey, thank you. Thank you all for taking the time here and this is a very, very long period of time here. Very much appreciated each of you that were able to stay to the end. And uh, thank you for your interest for each one of you that's, that watched through these and then also each person's presentation. Thank you for all your work. So uh, that's it for our class here. Very much enjoyed and very much enjoyed all of your presentations and the other things that we heard here. Please let's stay in touch as far as the Moodle page if you want to continue to communicate there. And if you have questions, certainly communicate uh, directly towards us as well. And then we will look forward to next year. Uh, 
So probably in the summer of next year, again, a class is structured like this. Thank you to all. And I will uh, finish our time out here because we've been able to, to have a good long class here at the end. So we're dismissed here. Thank you again to all of your presentations and have a good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.